Good morning. Welcome to our St. Kitts Nevis um, webinar, where we are going to be having a dialogue with you and sharing some of the information, I apologize, sharing some of the information that we have developed with you um, during the first three years of this project as we head into the fourth year of the project. Um, I would like to welcome my co-chair um, and ask that Latoya make some comments at this time. Are you on Latoya? Yes, I am, Professor Samuels. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Dear colleagues and countrymates, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this important event, webinar on dietary patterns in St. Kitts and Nevis, trends, drivers, and impact. Since 2018, the FAN project has been engaging with persons in St. Kitts and Nevis to implement activities geared, geared towards improving dietary patterns and dietary diversity among CARICOM populations in order to reduce the burden of diet-related non-communicable diseases. In St. Kitts and Nevis, we have mainstream nutrition as a priority in all our strategic programs, in line with our goal of reducing the levels of non-communicable diseases. This project, which is funded by the International Development Research Center in Canada, is a follow-on from two IDRC-funded projects, evaluation of the Port of Spain NCD Declaration and the Farm to Far project. This four-year project commenced in 2018, partnered with, the three, with three campuses of the University of the West Indies, Universities of Technology Jamaica, Cambridge, and McGill. Collaborators include Caribbean Agricultural Research and Development Institute, CARI, Inter-American Institute for Corporation and Agriculture, IACA, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, Pan-American Health Organization, PAHO, Healthy Caribbean Coalition, Caribbean Public Health Agency, CAFA, Caribbean Examination Council, and the Caribbean Community. Globally, there has been an increased focus on healthy diets because our food systems are not delivering on this. The sustainable developmental goals before us cannot be achieved if we do not pay attention to the way we eat today. We also have the SDGs, which place emphasis on improved nutrition and a functioning food system. Despite the critical importance of a healthy diet to our health and well being, we are challenged in getting reliable data on what people are eating at the individual level. Most of the dietary data available to policymakers are aggregate data at the national level. Although these data are useful for assessing and monitoring food security at the national level, they are not sufficient for accessing the nutritional adequacy of diets of the different population groups, such as children, pregnant and lactating women, and the elderly. To do this, it is important to estimate food consumption at the individual level. On behalf of the Ministry of Health, think it's and Nevis, I am truly honored and give my blessings and support to this collaborative effort. We have gathered to discuss, share knowledge, as well as gain, as well as gain experience as we aim to improve nutrition interventions available to us here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Thank you, have a productive meeting. Thank you so much, Latoya, thank you. You really set the whole um, webinar today in context. And we're going to get started in a second, but I just have a few um, ground rules. Um, this is a webinar, so participants will be muted and um, unmuted to ask questions. We are asking you to type your questions in the question and answer section as you hear them and as you go along. At the end of each session, we will have a very brief discussion on just clarification, and then we'll have a more fulsome discussion at the end but please type in your questions as we go along. Wanted to introduce you to the technical team, Catherine Brown, the project manager, 
um, as well as Ashley Foster, Foster Estwick, our administrator will be assisting um, in, in, in this process. Um, just want to remind you, there's a little getting to know you segment. We have asked you to answer two poll questions, um, which should be on the screen. And in a, in a while, Catherine will share the poll results. Um, and of course, you know, the usual curt courtesies that we would extend to our colleagues on the, on the call. Um, Catherine, have I left out anything? Uh, no, I think you've covered everything. So what I can do is I'll wait another maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds, so that everyone can finish answering the two questions on the polls, and then I'll share the results to the screen so you can mention. Okay. Um, in the meantime, I think we could um, start to look at our um, presentations. Um, at least I will just introduce them. The first presentation is from the Center for Health Economics, HEU, at um, UWI St. Augustine in Trinidad. Um, we are really very pleased to have this continuing collaboration with the Center for Health Economics. Um, and today, Charmaine Metivier and Samuel Gabriel are going to present to us the food consumption survey that they did in St. Kitts and Nevis and to reflect back to you what data we found when we did the research. Um, Catherine, are you ready or shall I turn over to, Kath, to, to Charmaine? I will start the polls right now. Okay, you're gonna share. Okay. All right, great. So these are the, um, this is who is present with us today. Private sector, one person, government four, for civil society one and other two. And what are you hoping to get out of this session? To improve knowledge about issues related to food security and nutrition, to learn more about the project, to network and to engage in civic duties. So thank you to those who have, um, um, have filled in the poll. And uh, I would now like to hand over to Charmaine and Samuel um, to do their presentation for us. Over to you guys. Good morning, everyone. I am Shamin Mativer. I'm from the HU Center for Health Economics at the University of the West Indies. I'm here together with my colleague, Mr. Samuel Gabriel, and we will present some of the results of a food consumption survey on eating patterns eating patterns, food choice consumption, determinants that was done for St. Kitts and Nevis. Let me just minimize this, the survey on my screen. Okay, can we have the next slide? A little bit about our data collection method. It was a non-probability sample that we took of conditions and divisions and the data was were collected from all of the 14 parishes and the sample size consisted of 255 respondents. Next slide. In terms of the eating patterns, uh, this survey, what we did, we asked respondents to give a self-assessment of their general eating patterns. And if we were to look at fruits and vegetables, the results showed that 45% of respondents use fruits one time a day while 53% of respondents included vegetables in their diets only once a day. Now we know that the recommended serving is five for fruits and vegetables uh, per day. So really what we're saying is that people are really under eating the number, of the, the portion sizes they need to have per day, the serving sizes they need to have per day. Next slide. We now look at some of the food choice determinants. Overall, what we see is that 40% of respondents believe that their general eating was unhealthy, while 60% of respondents believe that they generally eat healthy. If we break that down by gender, um, what we find is that 37% of females found that they taught themselves to eat unhealthily, while 47% of males 
so that they had unhealthy diets. And if we look at the reverse for, for males, males found that 63 uh, unhealthy diets, 47% of men believe that they eat unhealthily. Next slide, please. Now we're looking at how age correlates with general eating habits. And what this slide shows is that the younger you are, the less likely you are to see yourself as an unhealthy eater, while the older you are, the less likely you see yourself to be an unhealthy eater. Next slide. So we also examine how income relates with general eating habits. And what we saw is that respondents in the lower income brackets were perceived to have generally unhealthy eating habits. And as income levels increase, persons reported having generally more healthy eating habits. So if we take some of these um, statistics, what we'll see, those who were in the lower income brackets, um, let's take the 200 to 399 per month income range. Uh, we saw that 75% of those persons thought themselves to eat unhealthy, while 25% um, thought themselves to be healthy eaters. And if we look on to the age group, sorry, the income group, $2,000 to 3999 we see that it's sort of um, almost half and half, where 52% of persons in those income brackets thought that they eat healthily, while 48% found that they eat un unhealthily. Next slide. So what, for those persons who indicated that they eat unhealthily, we asked them to choose reasons as to why they thought they had unhealthy diets. Um, bear in mind that respondents didn't have to choose one. They, they could have selected more than one of these options listed here on the, on, on the chat. Some of the findings show that 68% of respondents who indicated eating unhealthily pointed to better taste of unhealthy foods as being among the reasons for their unhealthy dietary choices. While 66% of respondents who generally eat unhealthily blame the relative cost of unhealthy foods for their poor quality diet. Next slide. So now let's look at how income and age correlates with taste as a reason for unhealthy eating. So what, what these generally show you is that um, lower income respondents are more likely to point to better taste of unhealthy foods as a reason for their general unhealthy diets, while younger respondents chose unhealthy foods taste better as a reason for their unhealthy consumption patterns at much higher rates than older respondents. Next slide. Here we look at the economic reasons for unhealthy eating. And what we're finding is what we found was that higher income respondents are less likely to identify the economic factors of unhealthy food costs less. And this is what I, I can afford as being among the reasons for their general unhealthy diets. Um, and older persons, older respondents are less affected by these same economic factors. Next slide. So if we look at some of the recommendations, we have three main recommendations here. This is not um, all and sundry, but what um, we're finding is that from the study is that more needed to be done to promote greater food and vegetable intake across um, a broad, the broad population in, its, in itself, simply because we found that persons would only consume fruits and vegetables one time per day. And whereas we talked about the serving size of five times per day as being recommended. Secondly, as the superior taste of unhealthy foods emerge as the number one factor for influencing unhealthy diets, policies and programs targeting healthy food preparation will likely be impactful. Healthy foods need not be bland. And thirdly, the relative low cost of, and greater affordability of unhealthy foods were major influences of unhealthy eating in St. Kitts and Nevis. Therefore, we think that fiscal and other policies aimed at reducing the price of healthy foods 
while making unhealthy foods more costly and less affordable will encourage the substitution uh, where persons will now consume uh, healthier foods and switching away from those unhealthier food choices. And um, just to say that special emphasis should also be placed based on the young and lower income brackets based on the survey findings which, um, which emerged at that point in time. I thank you. Thank you very much, Shamin. Um, um, Ashley or Catherine, are there any questions for clarification in the chat? Samuel has responded to the questions already. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Samuel, who is also of the ATU, has responded to the questions in the Q&A already. So. Okay, so no everybody question. has seen those questions, okay. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm going to proceed um, to the next presentation. Oh, we have one more question that just came in. My apologies. Uh, okay. It's from Thelma Phillip Brown. Uh, she says, I Hi, think we, <laughs> She says, I think we need to rethink recommendations in a manner that serves our region. For the most part in the Caribbean, we believe that five servings per day means that we eat fruits and vegetables vegetables five times a day. Actually, by eating half a plate of fruits or vegetables, or if we eat fruits in season and lots of them, then we fulfill the servings per day requirement. No one in the Caribbean eats five times per day. I don't know who wants to. Yes, um, that's a very interesting, interesting comment. I, I didn't think of that, but I can well see that some people might interpret five servings a day to mean five different servings, meaning five different times that you eat. So I, I think this is a very valid point that we haven't thought about before. Um, we really need to reflect on that. Maybe Dr. Murphy, who is speaking next, um, might want to just comment on that, but certainly we need to take that under advisement. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Thelma. Hi, nice to hear you and see you. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to um, go on to the second presentation. Um, Dr. Maddie Murphy is going to share with us um, her study on consumer behavior from a qualitative perspective. So first we heard about what is happening and now Maddie will share with us why, which of course is most important if you want to change anything, you have to know why people are doing what they're doing. Over to you, Dr. Murphy. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So as um, Professor Samuel said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we have learned about consumer food consumption. And we've done this by doing some focus groups um, that were done in St. Kitts and Nevis, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and in Jamaica. So there were four focus groups done in um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and St. Kitts and Nevis each. And then there were six that were done in Jamaica to get a little bit more information and to lend some light actually to some of these quantitative um, results that you've just heard. Next slide. So some of our key findings and, and looking at changes over the time and lifespan, because these focus groups were done with adults. Um, they spoke a lot about what happens, you know, since they were children to now, they also spoke about for those who had children, what the experiences they saw of their children having now, um, especially since they as parents are the ones with the buying power. So one of the main things they spoke about is fast food no longer being a treat, but also questioning whether it should have ever been a treat, because now psychologically we have this idea that fast food is something that you get as a reward. Um, it used to be for those who had more access as a treat, but now it's really something that is served in larger quantities, that is purchased in larger quantities, particularly on the weekends. And what we have heard is that in country areas, for example, um, people have fast food as a treat when they go into town areas where they have more access to it. Um, for those who work or traverse in, in, in busy areas, they tend to purchase fast food now as their norm. And it's also quite popular for persons with long commuti commuting times to work and school. So they eat en route. Now, when we say fast foods, a lot of times people tend to focus on the big brands such as KFC and Burger King and, and sort of these imported food brands. But I think we, we need to also consider the convenience foods. So, you know, lots of those roadside vendors that maybe, 
you know, selling in containers. Um, those are also fast foods, they're convenience foods. So we're kind of using those interchangeably a bit and that's what happened in the focus groups. What we're also finding, and, and they spoke about this a lot, they say children don't eat them things. Children are not exposed to local seasonal fruits and vegetables the way they used to be. Um, a lot of the adults spoke about a time when they would be outside more, when they would go pick their own fruits and eat those. Um, they say, you know, children are just not exposed to them in the same way. And what they are exposed to when they go with their parents to supermarkets, for example, are the imported fruits, the strawberries, the apples, the grapes, which is something they remember getting, you know, during Christmas times, again, as a, as a bit of a treat. Um, so they see that as, as something that needs to, to happen, that there needs to be more exposure. But we also recognize that it goes back to cost and convenience. A lot of times these imported fruits and vegetables that come in, they're coming in in larger quantities than we get our local fruits and vegetables. So they're able to sell them for less. Um, so again, you know, the, the cost is, is overriding, you know, the, the, it's sort of the, the underlying factors is the cost and availability of those things. Um, and they're more consistent in terms of their availability. So that's what the children are exposed to. Food also is not being prepared at home as much. So they're finding that um, families are eating, you know, they're buying food and they're bringing it home. Um, they rarely are eating together as well. So they'll, they'll buy a lot of food, um, bring it, and then everyone eats as they, as they are ready, as they, as they come home. Um, but there's not that communal eating anymore. And men are more involved in the food purchasing and the prep than they were before. Next slide. So in terms of belly full but not hungry, they, the consumers are knowledgeable about healthy versus unhealthy foods. They are very aware of, you know, the risks to, um, of getting NCDs and, and sort of all the other things that come with um, eating unhealthy. But cost and convenience, as I mentioned, override knowledge. It still boils down to what is available and what's accessible. And even though things may be accessible, it still then comes down to affordability. Um, this was emphasized in one particular group, actually, out of St. Kitts by a single mother who explained that she knew the fast food she was getting for her kids was unhealthy, but she was working two jobs. She did not have time to prepare food at home. Um, fast foods were most convenient and cost effective, despite her better judgment. So there was definitely a bit of a tug and a feel of guilt there, but she was doing what she could um, and wanted to make sure that her children had food to eat. So the fast food was the option. Next slide. And this was quite interesting, the psychological side of consumption. So a lot of people spoke about this idea of early enforcement of eating healthy foods led to rebellion later on. So this perception that being forced to eat fruits and vegetables as, ch as children were leading adults to then eat them less because now they had choice. So, you know, they remember just being forced to eat something that they did not want to eat um, and they didn't have a choice to eat. So many adults are saying that they would not force their own children to eat the items that they did not want to eat based on their own personal childhood experiences. So this is really, really important in terms of how we, you know, look at interventions and the way we, we do our messaging. And we also found that a lot of the young people too have felt very um, invincible and protected. I, I should mention that as well, because, and, and this is from what Charmaine mentioned, um, they felt that, you know, health is a, a more holistic thing. It's not just about healthy eating, but it's also about mental wellness. Um, health has many pillars. So if it's a matter of, going to a movie to de-stress versus eating a healthy meal, they may sometimes choose the going to the movie to, to de-stress as how they spend their money because they see health as something that's just not about food only. Next slide. So in terms of recommendations that we have from this, particularly around interventions um, for increasing consumption of healthy local produce, we should put a heavy emphasis on exposing children, especially to healthy local produce in as many settings as possible. So not just in schools, because we talked about the fact that school meals, especially in preschools, you know, they, they were exposed at that point, but then there was no carryover at home, for example, or when they went out to other places. So they're only seeing that food in one place. Um, so, you know, more settings where they're exposed to healthy local produce, along with the information for them to make healthy choices. So they don't feel that they are forced to eat it, but that they're making a choice and they're making the right choice for themselves. Um, when there's foods, when there are foods that are introduced in places such as schools, we need to have follow through at home. Otherwise, children will lose interest in eating them. And then interventions really need to consider the psychological side of food consumption, not just in terms of change of behavior, but in terms of how we're messaging and marketing what we're doing so that we, it's not felt that we are pushing healthy food or, or nutritious food on people, but again, that they're making a choice for themselves. 
and we need to include men in interventions for healthy eating. Um, men are just as knowledgeable as women in our focus groups. We found no difference in that. But since they are increasingly involved in preparation of food, that we make sure that they have the tools and the knowledge in terms of being able to prepare food in, in a healthy way. And thank you very much. Okay, Maddie, thank you very much for that. Um, I had asked if you could respond to Thelma's point about the word serving and whether that people would interpret that to mean different times that you sit to eat. So I think this is a very, very important point. And, and again, it goes back to this idea of how we message and, and what we say, because we have pushed a lot on to, in terms of portion sizes and as you say, five meals a day. And I think that you're absolutely right that we need to allow people to understand that they could be having their five servings and two meals that they're having um, and less focus on, on the, the servings with making sure that they understand, yes, by eating, you know, whether it's two apples and a banana or whatever it may be, um, what constitutes a serving and what constitutes the total of those five servings. So it, it, it's less on the servings, but you know, this is, this is the amount that you need to eat per day. And I think that is, is, is very important and something that I think we haven't looked into that much, but probably need to ask some questions on because we haven't asked about that. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any outstanding questions in the Q&A section? Um, Ashley or Catherine? There are no questions related to Mari's presentation, so we can move on to the next uh, presentation at this time. Hi, okay. this is Catherine here. I just want to jump in that um, Samuel Gabriel had, um, had, a, had a comment to make. So Samuel, I'm going to unmute you now and you're welcome to speak. Um, yes, I, I had a comment, but I believe Mari um, might have, um, her response was in very much in line with what I was going to say. So I think we more or less covered that. Okay, with the servings and the, if a serving means a different, yes, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. it's, we, we, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, the language is a very peculiar thing. And um, we have to be careful with the language that we use to just make sure that we are communicating exactly what we want to communicate. Okay, good, great. Thank you very much. I'll ask so, you yes? Hi, Laugh. I'm just jumping in. Although there were no questions in the Q&A, there were some interesting comments made, actually. Um, so I just want to highlight those that uh, Thelma mentioned that we could emphasize smoothies for children as a way to get the requirements in. She also mentioned that we need to rethink recommendations. Oh, that was earlier. We need to rethink recommendations in a manner that serves our region. For the most part, in the Caribbean, we believe that five servings a day means that we eat fruit and veg right. five times a day. We discussed yeah. that. And then finally, Isabel had also said that she thinks that increasing eating five times a day and more in terms of grazing or snacking is actually ideal for eating fruits and vegetables. Okay, well, we, the language is important and how people interpret it is also very important. And as Maddie said, we haven't really investigated that and we need to because I don't think we are sure the best way to convey what we want to convey. So we have to, to, to find out what that is. Um, just to let people know that as soon as the third presentation is finished, um, we are going to be allowing people to unmute and ask their own questions and Latoya will help us, um, you know, get, you know, work with that section. I'll ask her to come back in as co-chair. So let me finally um, introduce um, Professor Fitzroy Henry. Um, he's Professor of Nutrition at University of Technology. Should have mentioned that <laughs> Maddie Murphy, sorry. Dr. Murphy is um, Senior Lecturer um, and Research at the Georgia Lee Chronic Disease Research Center, UWI Barbados. And I did mention before Charmaine and Samuel from Health um, Economics in Trinidad. So Fitzroy is going to talk to us about the vulnerability of households to food prices um, in regards to minimum wage appropriateness. Um, Fitzroy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Samuels, and good morning to all. Um, pleasure to be here and to link with my friends and colleagues in uh, St. Kitts and Nevis. The title is uh, Food Security, Vulnerability and Health Promotion. The two previous presentations focused um, on what people are consuming and why they're consuming. 
as the title suggests vulnerability, I'm gonna focus on the low cost diet in St. Kitts, Nevis, and I'll tell you how we get there. And also focusing on the low income group, because as you know, the patterns are changing where people can eat only what they can afford. So this is the background to this. So the first slide really um, tells you about what we intended to do. We looked at all 14 parishes and we looked at 191 food items. And this is the same number that we're looking in all the three countries that we're doing the work in. Um, we collected prices from supermarkets, municipal, what we call open markets and wholesales were available. And then a computer program actually selected the cheapest food items for a 2,400 calorie nutritionally balanced diet. Um, and this, to some extent, relates to when we talk about um, servings. We are trying to look at it in terms of the number of calories that are required per day. And uh, I just want to big up um, Latoya and, and her colleagues, three data collectors in St. Kitts and one in Nevis. And that's important as... Um, you will see later on because the same person in, in Nevis collected from all parishes there and the three data collectors in St. Kitts collected from the nine in St. Kitts. That's important because the differences we see is not because of a different data collector because one data collector collected from different areas. The next slide, please. This shows the um, that all the, the, the parishes in St. Kitts and uh, in the, the nine in St. Kitts and the five in Nevis were studied in this. And the next slide starts to show the results, what we have found. Okay, so what we have, and we look at St. Kitts first, and then we look at Nevis. This is in October, 2020. Um, so we have the nine parishes there and we have the average person kids at the bottom. What this slide is showing is the amount of uh, EC dollars that's required to obtain a balanced, nutritionally balanced diet. So for example, in St. Mary Kion, it was $22.98. In St. Thomas, Middle Island, it was $13.45. And it's in descending order in the high income and the low income groups. So you see that it, it was shared between the low income and high income. And uh, why I was mentioning the data collectors is because it, the 22, you notice how high that is, and it's pulling up the average for low income. Um, but it's not a fault of a data collector because the data collector, the same person collected in other parishes as well. So it, uh, we believe it is genuine in terms of the prices that we saw. I wanted to emphasize that because it is so outstanding where you had St. Mary Kion having such a high, and I'm, I'm depending on colleagues in St. Kitts to explain why that is so. So that is the first slide. The next slide looks at Nevis. And similarly, we see in St. Thomas Lowland, there is a particularly high um, cost of a uh, balanced diet, $15.45 compared with the others. Not as high as in St. Kitts, the disparity, but it is still high compared. All the others will $12 range. But this is the same person who collected in all five areas. So we can say it's because of some bias by a data collector. It's the same person. That's why I was emphasizing that the Nevis average, you notice, is $12.67 in high income and $13.42 in low income with an average for Nevis of $13.12. Now, this is in October 2020. And uh, I wanted to share with you the same information we have collected from the start of the project. So I'm going to give you the trend in the high income and low income uh, areas in the next slide. 
So when we look at the trend of the basket, this is the 2,400 calorie, calorie basket. We see in April 2019, October 2019, and then of course COVID came, and we are looking at two surveys <clears throat> that were done after COVID, and we just finished collecting for April. We intended to do April and October every year, but because COVID was at its um, highest point to date in April, we were delayed to July. And we've just collected April in this year, and we will continue to do that in October when the project will come. To, well, that would be the last survey in 2021. But looking at the pattern, what we see is that the high income area, um, $10.47 for St. Kitts and Nevis combined, and it went up to 15 went up to 16 and then it went down to 12.42 and we see the similar pattern of going up in the low income area and for reasons that um, you will have to help me to explain why it went down in october when we all thought that covid prices would have kept it up but that's for discussion later the country average shows the increasing rates as well the next slide now, what we did, we looked at the cost of the um, low-cost diet and used that as a percentage of the minimum wage in St. Kitts Nevis, which is 367 uh, EC dollars. And when we look at the, uh, that as a percentage, this is for one person, right? it's 2,400 calorie diet. We see the change in the high income area 22.5% in um, the early uh, study, then 25, 25, and then it dropped to 24. This is a percentage of the minimum wage um, for one person. And if you take a family of three, then you'll have to multiply that by three. So it might go up to about 70 something percent of the minimum wage. But this is just looking at one individual. All right, so this shows the pattern of increasing percentage of the minimum wage. It has not changed during our study, so we use the same minimum wage. And this is what we usually use to encourage authorities to raise the minimum wage when they think that the percentage is too high. The next slide really talks about the recommendations. The first one is where I'm at, hoping you will help me. Why is St. Mary Kayan and St. Thomas Lowland in Nevis have consistently high prices? The second is determine why prices in low income areas are higher in, in many cases. And on the average, you notice it was higher, even though one figure was pulling it high. The third, um, closely monitor the rates during COVID. We noticed that there was a fall. We will see what happens in the April survey that we are now analyzing to see if it continues to fall or it will go back up. And as I was saying, whether the 22 to 25% of the minimum wage is you consider acceptable, is it something that we need to um, address in terms of the minimum wage? Is the vulnerability too high with 22 to 25%? Or do we need to raise the minimum wage, which will reduce the stress, which will bring it down perhaps to in the teens? And the fifth recommendation is to continue monitoring the baskets as a vulnerability index. And we have plans to do that beyond the end of the study, which we hope to do um, from here until whenever the study ends. And finally, is identify and promote best buys for respective areas. What we mean by that, when we look at the prices of the different food items, we definitely will be able to identify the foods that are best nutrition for cost, what we call the best buys for the different parishes that we collect from. So in continuing the surveillance after the project, if information uh, is produced quickly, then authorities and the general public and consumers and shoppers can identify which are the prices that will give you the best value in terms of nutrition. 
So those are the recommendations. And uh, if there are any clarifications, I'd be happy to answer before we go into the general questioning. Thank you so very much, Fitzroy. You really have given us a lot of food for thought. Um, there is a question um, in the Q&A. Um, let me just bring it up. Uh, um, that has to do from Isabel Byron. Isabel, would you like to ask the question yourself or you want us to read it? Uh, Alafia, there's a, a question from Natasha Leader. Oh, uh, sorry. Isabel um, was for the previous presentation in response yes, to Selma, yes, I think. Yes. Sorry. N Natasha, I'm sorry. Natasha Leader, um, would you like to um, make your intervention? Can we unmute her? Yes, I've, I've unmuted. Oh, I've, I've asked if she can unmute. Natasha, you have the floor. You can unmute and, and make your intervention. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, I'm asking her to unmute, but the button is not changing. So I'm wondering if she's having, if there's some well, technical difficulties. Why don't we just read her, her question? Okay. The question yeah, is okay. there. She said, it's interesting that St. John is the poorest parish in St. Kitts, but their average food is the lowest. That doesn't correlate. Well, the prices of the food is not, is not expected to correlate with the area that you're in because there are many variables that go into and if you notice that the poor I don't know if um, Catherine you can go back to the slide what we notice in general is the poorer go, go back to the yeah the poorer areas um, let me take off the question right you notice the low income group is generally has a higher price um, than the high income group and uh, I've been asking this question, and this is not only in St. Kitts Nevis, we see it in Jamaica, and we see it in St. Vincent in some cases. Um, my, the, the explanation given to me is that the corner shops are used more frequently in low-income areas, and their prices are generally high. Now, I don't know if that holds water everywhere, but um, this is the explanation. Um, uh, one would have intuitively expected the high-income area to have higher prices, but that is not the case. So what it means that the low income group has a double whammy. First of all, they are earning less and they are paying more for the same 2,400 calories. And that I think is the, um, the critical take home point here. Um, what do we do in low income areas when we have the food prices higher than even the high income areas where people can afford it more? Can I ask Latoya if she can jump in um, and kind of give us some thoughts as to what's happening with this data that we're we are seeing here this morning? Okay, thank you, Professor. One of the things that in St. Kitts and Nevis, and like Professor Henry alluded to, some of this information is common. The major supermarkets in St. Kitts and Nevis, which are usually in the which which are in the high income area. They are also the distributors for these other um, supermarkets and corner shops that are in the other areas. So you tend to find a lot of persons that would travel to the high income area to purchase food items. Now these major supermarkets that are also located in the high income area because they are also considered distributors by the time these products, uh, services, or uh, items get to the shelves of those other entities, those other supermarkets or uh, small shops, within the smaller parishes, their prices usually is a lot more in order for them to make a profit. So that is one of the, um, the rationale that I can provide for now as it relates to that in St. Kitts and Nevis. I don't know if Mr. Bell, uh, Miss Weaver, uh, if uh, Miss Lira, who is, well, she said she is having some audio issue, uh, anyone else from the country team would like to add to it? 
And before they add, uh, could I ask the question about the possibility, the feasibility about price controls in St. Kitts Nevis? Is that completely off the wall? Is this something, is it a foreign topic or is something that is feasible? <laughs> well, I think it is feasible. However, more controls are needed for price control in St. Kitts and Nevis. Let's put it that way. But, but sorry to just jump in. Fitzroy, the, I, I'm not interrupting. Fitzroy, the point you made though, I don't know if price control could help that. Because what happens is that if the supermarket is also the distributor, people are buying at retail to then mark up to make a profit. Right, so but maybe if, if the government puts a cap on a particular item, regardless of what distribution system you have, that will be the cap. And this is why people don't like price controls and it is very controversial. But I just throw it in there because it's always comes up in discussions about whether it's just like rent control, you know, this kind of yeah. thing about, you know, controlling, you know, people's uh, profit margins. It's going okay. to create a lot of political uproar, as you can imagine. I just throw it out there to see if there is any, um, if there is any appetite for, okay. for that kind of thing. Okay, thanks. Let's hear from the country team. Um, Lindbergh Bell had his hand raised. So if you're still happy to talk, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, I'm seeing- Okay, you hearing me? Yes. Okay, hi, good morning. I, I agree or had a little what Blood Toy was saying. Um, all the major supermarkets that we have here, be it Hartsford, Ocean, Coastal, which most of them sell out to the rural area, they're gonna, the persons there will need to make a profit, so we understand that. We do have uh, consumer fears, and they do have officers who go out and do checks, spot checks, but I agree with what the saying also, we need to strengthen that area, because a spot check, you may have a price, now in April, one price, but then we get there in maybe August, September, the prices change. A lot of times these corner shops, they cater to persons who do not have their own vehicle to come all the way to town to shop, not to catch bus. And that's an increased cost when they're doing their grocery shopping. So they are now forced to buy whatever the price is gonna be in these small corner shops in the low income area. So they don't have much of a choice in it. So as, as the, the presenter before said, it's like a double whammy. Your income is low, and you're now being hampered by the high cost in food that you must consume. We all must eat, so that's definitely a factor. But um, I think something will need to be done in terms of being able to assess um, the minimum wage and the impact that, that has on the persons in the low income area in terms of ensuring that they have the proper amount of food or that they meet the dietary, ne the dietary necessity that they have in terms of ensuring well, they can eat healthy. This is something we need to look into. Yes, thank you. I have a question. As you, as you mentioned question that, you. sorry, sorry, go ahead, I'll you. Go on. So my question to, to the last speaker um, is, you know, and sometimes the prices in corner shops go up because they sell smaller quantities and they repackage. So they buy a pound of, you know, cheese, but they cut it into four quarter pounds, repackage, and then they sell each one for more than quarter the price of the total, if you know what I mean. Is, is this part of the problem? Definitely, I agree it is because um, I, I am from Bass City, the capital, but um, my family originally was from more the rural area. You go out there, you can buy a tin cheese from one of our major supermarket distributors. When you get to the rural area or the low income area, you're going to sell basically sometimes an ounce of cheese or bread and cheese, which is basically a small slice. Yes. By the time you finish, that small slice of that whole thing is going to give you four or five times the amount. Yes. So that does happen. And that's just with cheese. It happens with chicken, with yes. most of the basic things that we need for food. Yes. So, so that's part of the problem. But you're going to sell a one pound chicken. So that is definitely part of the problem. <laughs> okay. So the, where is there, are there other, thank you, sir. Are there other comments from our St. Kitts team? Yes, I see Telma has asked a question. 
Um, she said, what is the acceptable percentage of the minimum wage for a cost of the food basket? Would the percentage cost necessarily go down if the minimum wage is increased? Well, definitely it will go down um, if the prices remain the same. And this ah. is the... This is the <laughs> but this they is won't the, remain the same. <laughs> so, sorry? I'm saying they may not remain the same because part of the price of the product is the price you pay to the worker. Um, yes, and there's always a problem with minimum wage increases in terms of the businesses. They, they say, that, oh, they're going to have to fire people to pay more for minimum wage and so on. But that's a different discussion. I think the question is whether, um, the, you know, what is an acceptable minimum wage? Now, that's a value judgment. That is a policy decision. Um, what we try to do is just show the vulnerability, you know, um, and I asked the question, and Telma is asking me back the question, what is an acceptable percentage? <laughs> now, let me give you an example. <clears throat> in Jamaica, doing a very same study, um, the, 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 the price, if, you, if we compare U.S. dollars, huh, is $5.69 U.S. dollars for a 2,400-calorie um, basket. In Jamaica, that same 2,400 calorie basket costs three dollars and the 36 U.S. cents. So it's 5.69 U.S. dollars compared with 3.36. But you see, the the percentage of the minimum wage in St. Kitts is only in the 20s. In Jamaica, it is 48 percent. In other words, a lower U.S. a low, low cost if we compare U.S. with U.S., but yet it is 20, 48 percent. Why? Is because the minimum wage in Jamaica is um, 50 U.S. dollars, whereas the minimum wage in St. Kitts is 137 U.S. dollars. So yes, if you carry up the minimum wage, the price will go down. Whether 48% in Jamaica is unacceptable is for the Jamaican authorities to decide. We just present them the facts and the options. Whether 22 to 25% in St. Kitts Mavis is acceptable, I don't know. I mean, what we usually do is look at a family, a family of, let's say, four, um, with only one income earner at the minimum level. That will mean that the cost of a balanced diet, the, low, the lowest cost of a balanced diet will be over 100% of a minimum wage. If we look at, remember that this is just one, one individual with 2,400 calories. So if we take a, a I, don't, I don't know what the average um, household size is in St. Kitts, but in the Caribbean, it's really three, four, four point something. But usually you have two income earners. But if you just have one income earner and you have, say, a family of three, it means that you're moving from the 20s to the 60, 70% of minimum wage, which is, you know, that's just food. What about rent? What about, you yes. know, and, and the other things? So that's the kind of discussion that, that needs to go on at a different level. Um, but what we're trying to do in this project is just showing the vulnerability as time goes on. And hopefully, I don't know if people have ideas or, or, or suggestions of how we can use this kind of data to, uh, first of all, is it acceptable? I mean, um, it's, it's the lowest among the countries that we've been looking at. Barbados is 27%, um, the percentage uh, minimum wage. So whether that is acceptable or not is, is more of a value judgment, uh, a judgment call on, on the part of policymakers. Thank you very much, Fitzroy. Let me ask Latoya um, or any other members from St. Kitts if they can guide us towards um, what is the utility use of this present, the presentations we have made today, um, were they useful? And more importantly, what can we do with this information going forward to help to um, enhance dietary diversity in St. Kitts and Nevis? All right, thank you, Professor. I will go first. Um, yes, the information is extremely useful. And most of the time with a lot of this information, especially here in St. Kitts and Nevis, where we don't have 
recent data um, as you look to the food basket or the indiv uh, individual food consumption, um, these data helps us a lot to know what we, some of the, um, the rationals are the discussions we have been having, but have not been able to prove them thus far. Now I can say how it can be used um, for example, looking at delivering a food basket to St. Kitts and Nevis, this data can be what utilized. What do you suggest? I'm thinking that we can utilize this data to determine whether or not our current minimum wage is satisfactory in order to ensure that the households in St. Kitts and Nevis are able to afford um, the, basic uh, the basic nutritional needs. Um, I'm thinking that is one of the first things that we can actually start to do, looking at this data. Okay, okay, good. Um, can I hear from other folks as to what you think we can do going forward to advance our case? Does anybody have their hand up to speak? There are no hands up at the moment. Okay, I would like to invite Ambassador Thelma Philip Brown to speak. I just want to tell people that um, Thelma was the very first person who mentioned the, the possibility of this project to me. We, we met at a um, CARICOM Ministers of Health meeting and she pulled me aside and said, look here, there's this thing that we need to get done in the Caribbean. And four <laughs> years later, this is where we are. So thanks again, Thelma, for starting the process. And um, I'm going to give it the floor because I think you have some very important things to say. <laughs> um, thank you, Alafia. Um, thank you, Dr. Henry Latoya and everybody um, for this opportunity and for your diligence and your work over the past few years. Um, it is extremely interesting and, and commendable and I wish you every success as you go forward with this project. I, I have a, a couple of comments and I, I'm thinking, and in response to following on on the last conversation, I believe that nutritionists can recommend what is the ideal or, or the minimum percentage of what you earn that could be spent on a healthy plate. I think 48% of what you earn is really, really too high, but I think there can be a recommendation. I'm not sure how that is done, but maybe even if you look at around the world, at low income and high income countries and give some sort of estimates and guidance to say to these governments, listen, if you want your population to be healthy, they should not be spending more than a certain percentage of their income on a healthy plate. I think that would come in and I think that is something that the scientists, that the, the doctors and the nutritionists really need to do to give that kind of guidance. Um, second point I wanted to mention, I don't know um, in terms of the care on situation, why it is higher there. And, and I take some of the points that, that were made. Now, Kaon is, is a, not a major town um, and it is the one closest to Bastia. And people are more like, it's only five miles out and people are more likely to go into to Bastia to purchase um, the bulk of their food. And so I go to church in Keon and I'm think, reflecting now, there, there are not a lot of uh, like shops or well, um, well sourced um, or, or well stocked um, shops and areas that you can purchase things because people mostly will go into town. So I guess the few things that are sold there, people would buy them out of emergency, you run out of something and you need it and you can go to town. And so those people who do sell, maybe in order to make some money, they have the prices high. That, that is only speculation. I don't know why, but it will be useful to really to investigate why. Um, look at what is sold 
wear, um, the type of things that the number yeah. of shops and what they're sold. Um, another thing, maybe the de decline in prices in October. I know and I was saying early, earlier that there was a real boom in St. Kitts and Nevis in backyard gardening since the COVID. Um, I mean, it's, phen it's phenomenal. I, I, one of the things that the government did is give a, well, to, to, to farmers generally, they, they had a generous package. And so you had a boost in food production, but not even among the farmers, but the people themselves, backyard garden, and you see they put in this stuff on Facebook and so forth. So it may be that people were by using more of their own stuff and sharing food stuff, which is a thing that we really need to pursue in the region, sharing of food. Um, within the communities, right? because our in food important, we have one of the highest food import bills, and that is something. So it might be that the cost went down there. Um, and again, to, to emphasize the point I'm making in terms of whether it's five servings or some say seven servings, I think, you know, the message in there, I don't want to, I, I said that already. And again, I said, you know, growing up as a child, we loved, I mean, in Senkis, and I believe in Nevis too, we, we liked the idea of, of, of smoothies or things we used to call freco and frozen joys. And I'm thinking using fruits um, in, in that way in smoothies and so would be, I think children would like that. And so we should encourage people to deliver the requirements in smoothies, encourage um, the, 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 the parents to prepare these or the children even can do them themselves in a way to get some of uh, the food requirements. Um, another thing I would say that there's been increase over the years in um, agriculture in packaging and conquers and those kind of things imported are really, 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 uh, it's too much. And maybe we could emphasize more the packaging of fruits, the, the star fruits and the different thing, they're, they're packaging that more. And that is something that we probably should encourage. Um, it's dry fruits, but it's still fruits, the local package, packaged fruits. Um, fruit trees, we have taken over the years, we have taken a beating because of successive hurricanes and destroying all of the fruit trees. Um, so we need to keep replanting them and bringing, because as they said, when we grew up, you know, you just go out and you pick your fruits and it's not as easily, I mean, we are more urbanized for one, but I think we really could encourage people to plant more. And I think this is the time and the post COVID era for us to do it. Um, th that's all the comments I have for now. And um, I want to thank you again for this opportunity and really thank you for the work you have been doing in this area. One more thing I should say, and I, I want to raise again, I love you. I'm going to raise that with you because we're trying to push it here. The One Health approach, um, and I don't know because I know the chronic diseases are part of it. So as you're going forward, maybe not thinking in silos, um, the One Health to put the, 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 the plants, the animals, um, and the, the, the humans, and I was reflecting this morning on the proverb, if you have two loaves, sell one and buy a lily. So, um, so encouraging these children as we encourage them to think about the healthy diets, encourage them to think of the health of the plants and the animals and, and as well. I just, that, that is an aside, but I just wanted to throw that in for us to focus in as we go along and not continue to just work in silos. So we work in the health and agriculture and the environment and everything. Uh, sorry to throw that in there, but I didn't want to miss this opportunity. Thank you for giving Thank me. You. Th mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Thelma. And the last point is not a throw in at all, because mm -hmm. I think it's a way that we could really engage children to think about th their future, the world mm -hmm. that they want to see. Um, mm -hmm. It should be a sustainable world, which means that we have to make changes in how we eat, because mm -hmm. how we are eating is destroying the planet. So I think mm -hmm. it's a very good entree point to get mm -hmm. to children, to explain mm -hmm. to them why some of this stuff is important. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're taking notes of everything everybody is saying, and we're getting some very good suggestions. Um, so we're going to be following through with some of these. Are there any hands up or comments? Yes, we have one hand up. We have Lauren Archibald. 
Hi, good morning. I'm calling from Nevis. Um, I'm a retired I'm a retired public health nurse now working at the gender affairs department. But you know, I still do some of you know stuff for some of the stuff for health. Yes, after becoming a part of this group, one of my things that I decided to do as I realized that lots of persons know and do not have fruit trees. I started my own little project and I've already reached over 600 plus wow. trees. Plus I had done some um, pepper during the lockdown, but that this thing has started about three, four years ago. And I started to do it on my own and I gave persons like coconut trees, um, jackfruit, all kinds of different stuff. And for the vegetables, I would give, sow the seeds myself and give persons like pepper slips and um, other stuff, banana trees and all of that. So that was my little project and persons are so happy that they have them. And um, some of the golden apple trees that I gave them, the slips, they are bearing. And some would tell me that they are already making drink um, from those trees that they would have gotten. I only did that as part of a, of a sustainable development goal where, you know, to eliminate hunger and stuff like that. So that people can have their own thing and to encourage others to start planting, not only to feed themselves now, but to look at the, you know, the long run later on that their children can have, you know, something that they can go out to and say, well, my mommy had planted this tree and I know I can reap for, from it. So I, was, I just wanted to say that, and also at the Gender Affairs Department, we also conducted um, a workshop last year in November with backyard gardening. And we had targeted persons who normally go to the social services department to ask for handouts. That was a success. And ICA stepped in and they did a project with raised beds. So, um, persons now are doing their own little thing so that they can get their, their food. And I think that since COVID and the persons now are doing more agriculture, growing their own stuff, I think the food bill has gone down for some of them. They are eating local. Thank you so very That's much for your input. intervention. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing. I mean, this whole thing about planting fruit trees, I think is really critical because the point was made earlier about hurricanes knocking down what you have and the need to regrow. And you mentioned backyard gardens, which yes. Thelma had also mentioned. So these are two things, two concrete things that have started that we probably need to, to put more behind to make sure it, it, they're more sustainable and so on. Thanks I so very like, much. And I would like to say hello to Dr. Brown. We work together in Think It's. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, any more hands? Um, we actually are at one hour and we had um, planned to just keep you for an hour. Um, I just wanted to make a few remarks at the, at the end. First of all, um, to say that this is just the first of a series of webinars that we are going to be having. We plan to have another two at least webinars um, to again share the results of our research because we have done a lot more research in St. Kitts than what we shared today. So we have more results to share. And also as we enter the final year of our project, we are focused on sustainability. In other words, the things that we have recommended, we, we don't want them to die in June of 2022, which is when the project ends. We want to find some way of institutionalizing them and mainstreaming them in St. Kitts and Nevis. And, and this is really critical um, for us to get your assistance in this. Because if you see good ideas, for example, not our project, but the, the, the planting of the, the, the fruit trees, which you know really um, struck me, um, even something like that, you know, how can we support, enhance, sustain that kind of initiative going forward. So in our next two webinars, we're going to be putting our minds towards some of, these, some of these areas. And of course, we want to hear from you 
on the field, any recommendations or any commitments that you can give us in terms of the sustainability of some of these interventions. And of course, we would like to encourage the team in St. Kitts Nevis, which is composed of NGOs, government, um, private sector, the whole range of partners, because we know that this is a problem that goes across all sectors. So we need all sectors involved to come up with a um, solution. So thank you very much. And I'm going to give the final word to Latoya. Oh, I, sorry, Latoya. We, we need to, again, thank the IDRC, the International Development Research um, Center um, and the government of Canada for the funding that has allowed us um, to do these, the whole project and, and the webinars as well. Latoya. Thank you, Professor. And following your final words, we would like to thank the funding agency for allowing us to be able to implement most of these activities. And we are praying that, like you said initially, that we'll be able to have some sort of continuity with most of the interventions that was done, not only here in St. Kitts and Nevis, but also in our sister islands. Would also like to thank the presenters for being able to provide us with the results that have been done from the dietary patterns in St. Kitts and Nevis. We really appreciate hearing this data. And like I said, initially, we, some of this information, we usually say we know, however, we don't have the scientific proof to actually prove it and to um, materialize it in policies or other activities. So we thank you and the presenters for that. I also would like to thank my countrymen for being able to find time out of their schedule to attend this session. St. Kitts and Nevis is now going through what is happening in other Caribbean countries for quite a while now. We are actually experiencing our first, um, shall I say, community spread as it relates to COVID-19. So things are a bit different here for us in St. Kitts and Nevis. So I really want to thank the individuals who took time out to attend, and I'm hoping that the others would be able to join us for the other webinars. I would also like to thank our ambassador, Dr. Thelma Philip Brown, for always being so enlightening and have so, um, how shall I put it? Well, your comments are always on point. Yes. <laughs> your recommendations are always down to earth. You yes. always know how to hit the nail on the head. And I really appreciate you being able to take time out of your busy schedule to be here for the start of this meeting, to be here at the end and to provide um, recommendations. So thank you very, very much, um, Dr. Brown. And with that, I think we can end there until the next time. Thank you, team. Thank I, I, I have a request. I have a, I have a request for all of us to turn on our cameras so that we can get a photograph of all of us. So um, if folks can just turn on their cameras, please, everybody, and then we'll take a picture um, so we can have something on the website. A few people still need to um, show their face, please. <laughs> Thank you, Charmaine, you just came on. Can I call you out, Lindbergh? And who else now to turn on the camera? I think we have, okay, I think we have most people now. Okay, somebody's taking a photograph. Ashley, you took the photograph. You're muted, Ashley, I'm not hearing you. I did not take the pictures yet. Okay, should we all smile now? <laughs> Just give me a second. Uh, Catherine, do you think you can take a picture that you have the host privileges? Because I can't from my end. I'll be honest, I have never taken a picture on Zoom before. I, I can you do just a screen use a camera and take a picture. We can do a screenshot. Anybody, anybody who has a full screen, can you take the picture, please? And send it to us since we don't have the technology. We don't have the... Jamal, can you do that for us? Is there anybody who... All right, everybody, in three, in two, 
in one smile. Alrighty, we should be good. Give me two seconds. Let me ensure that it is safe. I'm not getting in. I don't know why. Oh, you, oh. <laughs> was that Jamal who took the picture? Yes, I did just now. Just give me two seconds. I'm just confirming that it was actually. Yeah, we have it here. I have I have a shot, but okay. if um, y'all want to go one more time, we can always do one more picture really, really quickly. Okay, go ahead. In three, in two, in one, everybody smile. Look at the camera. Yeah, we get to go. Okay. Thank you all so very much. And I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar where we will continue the discussion um, about food um, and nutrition security in St. Kitts and Nevis. Thank you, everyone, and good morning.